In this episode, I'll be speaking with Dressage Naturally instructor Lisbeth Jorna. She is the creator of Sport and Horsemanship United, and I met Lisbeth in around 2008 at a clinic that I did in the Netherlands. She became a student and a big fan of Dressage Naturally, and then after she spent 10 weeks with me here in Florida, I made her uh, a licensed Dressage Naturally instructor. She is a very versatile horsewoman, and she has decades of experience in dressage as a rider, a judge, and an instructor. She also loves jumping, eventing, and playing at Liberty. So hundreds of riders, both in her home country of the Netherlands and around the world, have already found the key to their horse's hearts, mind, and body with Lisbeth's positive and oftentimes creative support. She also coaches students inside my virtual course, Finding the Sweet Spot of Healthy Biomechanics. I think you're going to love our conversation. She shares a bit about her journey, and she talks about how she incorporated Dressage Naturally into her training, and how you can too. We'll talk about some big picture concepts that will help guide you to becoming more confident and more empowered to create beautiful things with your horses. So here we go. Episode 91, Dressage Naturally Instructor, Lisbeth Jorna. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Here we are. Hi, Lisbeth. Hello. (laughs) From all the way in the Netherlands. So thank you so much for joining me here on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. (laughs) So we're, you're the first one here. We're going to, I'm going to start featuring some of my wonderful Dressage Naturally instructors. So um, you are the first one to do that. So I really appreciate that. And uh, it's so fun because the, you know, each dressage natural instructor is a little bit different and coming from a, a bit different background. Uh, so maybe we can start by just uh, kind of telling people how you first uh, got interested in dressage naturally. Yes, well, you know, that's that's a little bit of a story and it gives me an opportunity to give a little bit of my background. Um I started out as a riding school girl when I was nine, and over time I got to teach there and ride uh, horses. And when I was around, I think, 30 years old, I bought my first horse. And I basically started doing what everybody else around me was doing, which was riding competitions, dressage competitions mostly. And um, so over time I got to be pretty good at it. And I did all the official instructor courses of the Dutch Federation, and I became a dressage judge. But as I got higher, as I climbed higher up that ladder, I got to a point where I thought, okay, I need new teachers because I want to kind of go through that glass ceiling and go grow into national level. So I went to more you know, the famous teachers. <laughs> and I discovered that everything, instead of everything becoming more beautiful and lighter and um, more elegant, it got to be harsher and uh, more forceful. And well, in the end, basically, long story short, I didn't really like it. <laughs> so I decided to quit this whole journey. And um, because I thought there must be something else, there must, I, there's a gap in my knowledge. Um, and there's a gap in, in my feel. And so I went on a search and I ended up um, doing natural horsemanship with people like, like Mark Reshid who's absolutely amazing and um, Honza Blaha, but I, you know, I found a Pirelli home study package and I decided to dive right 
into that because I was, by that time, I had a quite a busy job. I had a quite a busy husband. I had a little child and I had a few horses at home. So there was not much time to go out and do clinics and stuff. So I did this whole Pirelli thing on my own and I, I graduated um, the old level three after I think, I don't know, one and a half year. And um, and then all of a sudden, everybody in the Netherlands thought, "What the heck? Where where the heck does she come from?" <laughs> and but <laughs> because I never met any natural horsemanship people, I just did it in my backyard. And um, but then also by that time, I this I started to notice that my own riding became a little bit messy. My posture didn't, you know, wasn't that nice anymore. My beautiful dressage horses, by that time, Evo and Matador, um, I noticed that their musculature uh, was not so good anymore. They moved in a not so beautiful way anymore. So there I was with another gap. <laughs> and then somehow, I don't know, you showed up in the Netherlands. Um, <laughs> so um, I remember, I don't know, it, it was about 2008 or something, I guess. Yeah, I think so. And... Uh, yeah, and, and so I did this clinic with you, and then all of a sudden, you know, all those separate pieces that I had started coming together. It felt like a circle really, you know, closing, becoming a real connected thing. Everything was integrated. And so I was hooked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and well, and you, a few years later, I was at your place for 10 weeks, and... Mm -hmm. um, you know, I never recovered. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I love that you share that story because it, it's a really common story for students that come to me. You know, they, they were in sort of more traditional, something was missing. They go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, go to, you know, natural horsemanship or more partnership-based training. And they go over there and it's like, oh, wait a minute, now something else is missing. And then they, they kind of luckily, hopefully find, find me and then put it together. So that was my journey too. So that's, I think, why you and I resonated so much because I remember, you know, seeing you, I think you were in a couple clinics that I went to um, over the, over a couple of years in a row. And it was just, I really connected with you because, because of our similar journey and you were so like ripe for that piece. You could tell you were just like a sponge and just asking a million questions and they were all like really specific and you know and then on your big beautiful matador um horse so yeah you left an impression on me and then yeah i had this idea for this 10-week program and there you were <laughs> here in florida with me so really cool um so i think what i'd love to ask you a little bit about then is you know now that well, fast forward now you've uh, been incorporating dressage naturally principles and exercises and um, you've been teaching more and more you're a coach inside our virtual sweet spot course um, maybe can you share a little bit about how you incorporated the dressage naturally stuff into into your vision because one of the things about dressage naturally as you know is it's not, it's there are specific exercises and sort of guidelines, but it's much more about changing the way you think about things. And it's more about me, you know, dressage naturally helping you achieve whatever you, you know, whatever anybody wants to achieve with their horses. So um, I think that yeah. how it's incorporated is really unique. So maybe speak a little bit about that. Yeah. I, you know, um, <laughs> being a little bit a, st a stubborn person, <laughs> um, uh, things need to make sense to me. And I also think uh, that for a lot of people that is the case, whereas even from primary school, we have been taught to do things a certain way because that's what people do. And we're kind of programmed. And I'm, I'm a little bit aversive to rules and methods that are limited. And, um, and I also, you know, if, if people tell me you need to use that rein or that leg and then that should happen and the horse doesn't do it, um, it doesn't make sense to me to put on more pressure because, yeah, you know, the horse is my friend. I don't want to pull a nose, nose bend tight 
because everybody else does. So uh, for me, it's it's like uh, love and logic and principles uh, prevail over rules and methods. And uh, what I really like about what I learned from you and what really resonated with me is the openness, uh, the curiosity, uh, that, and the fact that dressage naturally is not really a system with limits. It's it's open basically to everything that works and that is fair to the to the person and to the horse. And um, what I also like is um, yeah, what you just said. You know, everything. Um, we, we like to help people get the results they get, but you can only help people get the results they get if you teach people to help their horse. Mm -hmm. So the helpfulness towards the horse, and for us as an instructor to, towards both the horse and the student, is kind of a, like, a, like a central value. Mm -hmm. And um, so... You know, um, you and I have also been in this Tony Robbins journey mm -hmm. for a little bit. Yeah. Or a lot, basically. For me. <laughs> and they talk about away from values and towards values. So, And there were certainly things that I wanted to move away from, like all the force and uh, the, 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 um, the critical judgmental state of mind, the pointing fingers... Um, <laughs> things like that, and just, just the rules and regulations. And I yeah. wanted to move towards uh, openness and freedom and helpfulness towards the people and the horses and fun, you know, just crazy fun, just do do do, do fun stuff. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, th those things are really, for me, big values, and, and this is why we probably connect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, you know, so much has happened between 2008 and now. Just when you think of, you yeah, know, iPhones only came out in 2007 or something. So, you know, back in the day for you and me learning, you learned from people that you were there with and there was a way it was done. And, you know, so those systems can work to a degree. So, you, you know, people tended to just want to like, just work harder and do it better. And I think these days students are exposed to so many different kinds of techniques, which can be a blessing and it can also be confusing. Um, but what yeah. I started to notice when I kind of got out of my little dressage bubble um, where I was is that there's lots of, there's so many elements of what I want to create with a horse and this one little system I was following didn't have all the answers, but I could bring in and bring in and bring in and bring in. And I thought, gosh, what a shame, you know, if you miss that. And so yeah. many people are missing stuff for being afraid of, you know, doing it wrong. But with all that said, it can be confusing, right, to pull in all these different methods because oh, sometimes they conflict, yeah. seemingly. <laughs> I, think, I think the question that I get, and probably you too, that, that we get a lot is that, um, uh, you know, pe people come from all kinds of backgrounds into our, you know, onto our path and mm -hmm. into our lessons. And they come from straightness training. They come from classical dressage in hand. They come from competition. They come from track. They come from, you know, they come from total 100% focused biomechanical healthy movement. They come from um, positive reinforcement training. They come from all kinds of direction. They come to us, and what they what I usually notice is they come, they approach us because there is a missing piece. Mm -hmm. They know there is a missing piece, but they don't know what it is um, because you don't know what you miss until you know what you miss, right? So uh, I think we've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but what people then ask, you know, the, we, we teach them new ideas, new things. Uh, we teach them to think for themselves and choose their own values and, and, and um, uh, things that they want to achieve. And they have their own, own goals, which can be very, there's a lot of variety in goals with horses. 
And then they say, you know, they, they are in a clinic with me and they come from this different background that says A. Then they come to me and I say, let's try B and C and maybe even D. And then in the end of the clinic, they ask me or somewhere along the, along the journey, I've learned this, but now I learned that uh, you teach me this. So what is good? And I think, you know, I, I really want... I really want people to think for themselves. So that's why when I start to ask them questions, questions that start with a W or an H, like how, when, why, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> how much, <laughs> uh, what, you know, to, to help people find their own values and their, their own journey. And um, I think that's super helpful because then it starts to make sense. And then they start to see the logic for themselves and for their horses and um, and then they also become capable of choosing within all the systems and ideas and, and, and the crazy exercises that we come up with. Sometimes I know we're a little bit creative, <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> um, but then they, they start to then they start to to kind of put together their own uh, magic soup. And uh, I love that. I love that when people really think about you know, think about finding for finding out for themselves where they want to go and what values they want to honor. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, everything you just said, there's so much in there. And that's, you're really speaking to the, the empowerment piece, and the independent problem solving yeah. piece, which is so core to me, you know, not students who come and go, okay, tell me what to do, <laughs> you know, but you know, students, yeah. who come going, here's what I'm trying to do. And here's where I'm getting stuck. And to to give people the permission to trust that they know what, what feels like it's working and what doesn't. But I, I find a lot of students think they need to be like, quote, the good student and follow the system and be like subservient to the system. And I always think it's the other way around. It's the job of the system to serve you. What do you want? And this is a big tool. Let's see if, if, the toolbox that dressage naturally has can help you, but it's, yeah, it's that creating your dream and thinking. And I, I love to talk to my student, to the students a lot. And I know you do the same thing to get them questioning and to get curious and to think, you know, let's look at the cause and effect because yeah, there's so many different aids for things. There's so many different ways to do it. If you start looking, so you got to look at, all right, with this horse in this moment, what's happening, what do you have, what's missing, and what's a way to explain it. And to to take that moment to sit back and just think a little yeah. bit and not just follow, yeah. follow direction, you know, follow the narrow lane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And, and I know that a lot of, a lot of, when, when we work that way, we also find ways to solve the missing pieces. Just by example, I have one very advanced rider, um, a lovely lady with an absolutely amazing horse in my year course here. And she rides competition on a ne- national level. And it's really cool because the other people of the group come from a totally different background. So they kind of are really complimentary. But um, she said, one of my biggest problems is that my horse is so tense and scared. Um, whereas, you know, riding wise, She's pretty successful, not always the way we would like it to be, biomechanically speaking. Mm -hmm. But her her most important number one problem was tension. And she has been here. We taught her. I taught her the moving massage um, and some other relaxation things. I taught her to really pay attention to her own body and discover things about symmetry. Um, And... (laughs) She had had only two lesson days of this training year. And just last week she said, well, you know, I haven't been to a competition for a long time, but I went to a competition last week. And my horse came from the trailer, got got off the trailer, and was just as tense as he usually was, like kind of lost in a new environment. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go and play with movie massage. and, And at a certain point, after like, 10 or 15 minutes he just stopped and looked around and he was totally okay I could go back to my my trailer he stood still wow I could saddle him he was happy 
I could mount him. He stood still. Normally he takes off like a rocket. I could just wander around. He was interested in people and other horses. She did her test. Uh, she said, I think, it's so cool. She already thought, well, hmm, I could look for some other qualities, but she got wonderful compliments from people who said, your horse looks so happy. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she was happy too, because there was not so much tension. And I thought, okay, sometimes yeah. it takes only a little creativity, creativity, the right questions, mm -hmm. finding the missing piece. And solving it in a way that maybe other instructors do not have solutions for. Um, but we do because we're so open to anything that works right. and that helps the horse. And I thought, you know, those are wonderful examples. And, um, yeah, you know, ask me for examples. I keep I keep on going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's. I think it's the holistic part of it. You know, especially as you get more advanced, your teachers and coaches end up being very specialized. So, you know, it's yes. this narrow focus again, and they're looking on the specialty of riding the test and stuff. And sometimes you need somebody to step back and go, but wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> your horse isn't relaxed to begin yeah. with. Can we do that piece? And and to recognize that a, dress, you know, a dressage coach is a specialist, and not all dressage problems are dressage problems. <laughs> Exactly. Um, the flip side, exactly. some you know, we need to be able to look at the relaxation part, but also the biomechanics part. And when my friend Sharon came over, she's a trainer, upper level trainer, and she had a young horse, and it was having some um, tension and what she thought was more um, mental emotional things. And she's like, "Can you take a look?" And I watched it online, and then watched her ride it, and you know, she was trying to do really long and low and baby horse stuff, which would be correct. But then I could watch and I go, you know what, the horse is getting emotional, but it's getting emotional because she's not balanced. And so I actually said, you know, ride her up with a really tall, long neck and um, went against what she was thinking to do. But so again, it's that piece of how does the mental emotional affect the physical and to to have that luxury of seeing the whole picture and giving yourself that range to go, what is it? Is it mental? Is it emotional? Is, is it physical? Which is the root cause? And not just stay on this narrow lane because otherwise we just think about partnership communication or we go over to someone else and we just think about biomechanics. And that's really my dream is that we are, we're really looking at the whole horse. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, nowadays, um, here in the Netherlands, at least, but probably in more places in the world, there is a ton of focus on healthy biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a ton of focus also on the well-being of horses in horse management and how horses are kept, being kept. And um, But the thing is, those pieces do not really connect somewhere. Whereas we like to think about the whole horse... Um, like the whole day, <laughs> the whole day, training, management, how they live, how we connect during the whole day, even in daily handling and all this stuff. And um, I often come across students who have done a lot about a lot of study in healthy biomechanics, but their horses are basically mentally, emotionally all over the place. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, but the cool stuff is, you know, these are often pretty capable riders too. But if you give them that piece, magic starts to happen. Yeah. And I, I love that. I love it. It's, it's just so cool. And sometimes it's also, you know, instead of thinking, okay, over, I, I, they're looking through this filter of balance. So the moment they see a horse, the only thing they see is balance. Right, And then I see a horse that's out of balance, not because we cannot talk about balance with him, but we cannot talk at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so it, and then it's so, so, so cool or, and sometimes they can talk about balance, but they just don't know how. And we give them some really logical uh, systems and plans, how to build up that communication but then I always say, like, you know, I want it to be this way. Like, we do not 
we do not steer or manipulate the horse's body to get healthy biomechanics, but we talk to their brain and let the brain organize their own body. Let their brain organize their own body. So there is no brace. And um, because the moment we manipulate, you know, our nature, our instinct, and also the horse's instinct, when we put pressure on, we give pressure back. When we pull, we pull, you know, the other partner pull, pulls back. But if we talk to their brain and let their brain do the organizing and coordination of their own body, then everything is without brace. Yeah. But that does mean their mind needs to be open. And their mind can only be open when they're relaxed and trust you, when they're confident and confident about us, but also confident, confident about themselves. Um, so, yeah, the whole, it's the whole horse that counts, uh, both in training and in daily handling and in how they live and in every second that we meet. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was beautiful. Yeah, that is. It's the whole it's the whole picture. I feel like we need to like pause and lick and chew on that one. Yeah. All right. So um you um get to spend a lot of time talking to dressage naturally students, not only in the Netherlands, but all over the world through the sweet spot course. Uh I thought maybe because of your experience helping students through that course uh, remotely and, um, you know, through video coaching and the live calls, but also with the, the courses and programs you do there in the Netherlands, uh, what do you feel are some common things that you find yourself repeating or, or common um, things that students need help with? Oh, the first thing that pops into my mind is this question horse, how can I help you? Um, <laughs> and, um, and asking them to answer that question. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, certain things, you know, in the sweet spot course, we basically talk about how to get your horse relaxed, energized and balanced. And that's such a great summary because even you know, if we ask people, okay, if we would just think about these three parts, what would be right now the part that stands in the way of progress the most? It sounds like the, the questions are sort of around, you know, where do I start or what do I need to improve? Because both of those um, suggestions of, you know, the one is asking your horse, hey, how can I help you with this? Um, and the other is just go to those three conversations. So both, I'm imagining people are like, I don't know where to start. You know, something's missing. I don't know what. Um, I love the, can you know, that asking your horse, how can I help you? That's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I found, I mean, I, I do that because I think it turns on curiosity, right, in the person's brain. And it sort of, it's an empowering question, right? Because just telling a student, hey, why don't you ask your horse? It kind of says, number one, um, you'll figure out the answer. And number two, you're able to, you're able to listen to your horse is kind of implied in that, that little exercise. Um, I find that just really amazing. I don't, I think, I don't know if I've ever had somebody not come up with a solution, using that it might take a minute for them to quiet down and actually do it how about have you found that too sometimes we, we're more the coach than the instructor <laughs> um we're the coach to find those pieces and we're the instructor to give them kind of new solutions that they never thought of um, but what i also think like sometimes they really don't have a clue you know even that question kind of blows up their brain <laughs> um, which I know that the first time probably you asked me those kind of questions, my brain exploded too. So, <laughs> but what I often say when to, you know, to kind of get them over that threshold. So, okay, why don't you just start what you usually do? There's no good or bad. There's no judgment. There's just what is. And, and this is a phrase that I really often use and people who know me or, you know, who come into my lessons, they know. They say, okay, let's just see what we have. 
Yeah. Let's just see what we have. And then we'll just figure out what next. And that gives such an open, uh, open start of everything. Um, without any criticism, just, just, you know, it's, it's open. It's what it's, you know, we let things be what they are and as imperfect as they can be. Um, because nobody, you know, even if you see us writing, you know, it's, it's never perfect. What is perfect anyway? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So exactly. let's see what we have is a great place to start from. If you, if, if the question if the questions are a bridge too far. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, that's where um, I start to use the three, three kind of main filters of is, is there partnership foundation issues happening is, or, or is that okay? And it's more of like how your horse is moving problem, or is it, Oh, it's a gymnastic problem, like engagement and bend and things like that. That's another yeah. way to kind of get people in the ballpark and starting to, to think, okay, if things aren't going the way I want, like which department should I start, you know, should I start in which yeah. bucket does it go in? Yeah. Yeah. And then even, even then the curiosity to, to not do too much direct line thinking. Um, I had a person here, also a lovely writer and she, you know, the horse was good. The sweet spot was pretty sweet. And I thought, Hmm, how can we create a sweeter sweet spot so that we have an even stronger home base to grow from, to go next level from? And, um, you know, I thought before we tell the horse to do something else, let's, let's just check up on our, you know, on ourselves. And the only thing we talked about, like, do we have enough, do we have the same pressure on both stirrups? Mm -hmm. Do we have the same pressure on our butt cheeks in the saddle? Are we in the middle of the saddle? Do we have the same pressure on the reins? And she discovered that um, the pressure on the stirrups was kind of continuously right more than left. So she said, oh my gosh, this is really like automated. This is like really me all the time, probably. Wow. So I said, she said, what can I do? Do I lean over right now? I said, no, you're just... Give that, give that left stirrup a little push every step. And it took only two little pushes and the whole horse changed. Wow. <laughs> that was just, and she was totally blown away. Like, is that all it takes? Well, I said, I didn't know, you know, <laughs> we just tried something. <laughs> yeah. But it yeah. was like a super, it was a lovely discovery because the whole top line of the horse opened Whereas he was, be, you know, behind um, behind the vertical, immediately his nose went out front, and he 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 got more bounce in his stride. So it was like a major change, with yeah. a super eeny meeny little thing that the, yeah. that the right. Thing. No, I love that, and it kind of it's like okay, there's a guiding guiding principle. So I love all these like guiding principles or places to look, and so it's. You know, you, we often do a little bit of work to get to the sweet spot or to get what we want. And then the next game is to get in that active neutral, right? Find the place where you're doing exactly what you need to sustain it and not a drop more. And so what you just described is kind of going into that sweet spot and that active neutral and going, well, how could that active neutral be even more, you know, even symmetrical, light? balance, you know, and, and so I love that, though, without sometimes the best way to improve is not to ask for more, but to make sure you're able to do what you are doing with more ease, and yeah. more synchronicity and, you know, all of that. So that's a really nice example of, of something that I think is a, you know, it, it works. <laughs> and it's another good guiding yeah. principle. But it's, it's also immediately, immediately it sets a new standard. Mm -hmm. You know, once you once you felt that, you think like, oh, I want to go there again. Yeah. Right. That's that's a magical part. Just just this weekend, I was riding with Manfred in the forest on on Cubus, and you know he has these crazy long legs and he's a little bit uncoordinated. But at a certain point, we were trotting pretty up up tempo. And he was, I, I don't know, I'm still amazed. He was, 
He was very consistent, super light, uphill. Um, every step was the same. It felt like we were riding a cloud. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is possible. Yeah. And I'm always going to want to go there again. <laughs> yeah. And isn't it amazing how sometimes those those big changes, they're like, they're like so close, right? They're so close by, but we just need to practice putting our attention on it. Number one, putting your attention on it and just saying, hey, I wonder what else, what could change here, wonder what's possible. And then that little bit of experimenting, right? So just you got, you guided that rider to go, well, think about your stirrups, what's there, right? And then just try try pushing this it was an experiment right because you didn't even know yeah. but you're like but let's find something and let's experiment what if we push on this stirrup a little yeah. bit more and see if we yeah. even it and there's these little tiny changes that can just you know the, the doorway to something magical is often very small <laughs> you have to find it <laughs> but if yeah. you can get through it you know and and going out in the woods it's like there's another experiment right let's take this horse yeah. do what we always do but do it in this other circumstance I'm sure he was feeling a little inspired or whatever. It's this tiny change, but can give you a new sensation yeah. um, better than, you know, as an alternative to just more leg. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like the standard age. We need more. We, we force more. We, we put on more pressure. We get more critical. We get more ambitious. We want the horses to keep their shoulder in for more. Uh, a length of time and this you know this feeling with the rider and with Kubis this weekend was really like well exactly what your what your main main quote is like never ever 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 <laughs> underestimate how things can improve beyond your imagination yeah. exactly. it's like there's always something else there yeah and the the kind of what made when you're talking about that made me think about you know, especially with people who compete, but even with people who don't compete, there's this feeling of um, sort of like, yeah, but I need to be able to ask my horse for it. So sometimes with the experimentation, it's like, okay, that's nice. In the woods, he trotted nicely, but I need to be able to ask my horse for it when I want. And so, but what I find is people, a lot of people get too focused on that. Like, yes, you're going to need it in the competition, but to develop it, might take a little more of a winding road. And then once you have the thing, like you said, once you feel it, you can't go back and the horse feels it too. Now that you have this thing, then the game can be, all right, can I motivate it? Can I get better? Can I call upon it? Can I find it in different circumstances? And then eventually we get it on demand. But I think... Yeah, uh, yeah I think sometimes it's not even, you know, the it's not even asking for it but helping the horse no i say it the wrong way creating the circumstances in which the horse can do it himself mm -hmm. exactly and so and that is that is not asking that is not even demanding that is just kind of making it happen making things possible so that the horse can show up as the best version of themselves because they they can fill in the gaps that we cannot. Exactly. And because most of life is not a competition. <laughs> and so we have, you know, so many people are practicing the, but I need it now, but I need it now. And what you're describing, you know, and that setting it up so that we create the circumstance where the things that used to take a long time are presented and the horse is offering it and they're proud and they're able. And, you know, then the last piece might be, and can I put it all together on this day over here um, and have everything? But yeah. if we if we try to get it so that we have it, <laughs> then that's a it can open up to that brace and the horse feeling like we're always yeah. taking things from them. Yeah, exactly. It's more like it's 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 a strange game though because people are you know you and I and everybody we're basically all control freaks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? So in many in many ways in our lives, and um, this is basically totally something different. We want to create circumstances, and then 
um, kind of do it in a way, educate our horses in a way that they know that they can put in initiative and fill in the gaps when they're they get the opportunity mm-hmm. and that we reward it at the moment they do so. So their self-confidence grows and grows and grows and, and they get more, they can do more and more themselves if they get, you know, if we guide them and give them the opportunity, but that is totally the opposite of control. And I think, you know, that is kind of in the beginning when people start doing this, or especially people that come from a very competitive background it's like a total, total opposite of what they're used to. Absolutely. And, um, and I think I have a feeling sometimes we, we and, and also, you know, people, maybe recreational riders, you know, we're all, all humans are control freaks. So we all want to make things happen. And, um, but it's, I find it such an exciting game to turn that idea around. And of course, sometimes we need to ask ask our horses to be there now. I mean, if you if you if you have to cross the street and the car's coming, he has to stop now, right? Safety first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we need to have some some things in place. But for all the for all the other details in dressage and stuff, it's basically you know opening up opportunities for the horse and then let the horse do it. Yeah. Yeah. And um that that takes well guts maybe even. Yeah, it takes creativity. It's the art. That's the art form. And it takes really um self-awareness because it's you and the horse. That's there's not just a step 1, step 2, step 3, follow the path, make it happen. It's it's this dance together mentally, emotionally and physically. Yeah. Um and no two, no combination of no two combinations of horse and rider are the same, and that's what makes it yeah. <laughs> interesting. But it makes it a, a in every moment, what's the dynamic and how to play with that dynamic, and and it's also that yeah. game of I have, I have, I want to go somewhere, right? So you you know we want to go somewhere. We have a sort of picture on the horizon of maybe what we want to be able to do with our horse. And how do we swim in that space of, I'd like to get there. Here's where I'm progressing to yet not put the walls up and make it a, this is the only way you're going to go. Can we do the meandering path there and, and take our time but also be progressive. That to me is one of the most interesting things that I'm (laughs) still, Every day, I, I think about it. We we have to think about it every day. How do I progress and be fair and set it up and wait and yet still have it happen? That's the game. Yeah. Yeah, and I like that you say wait, because maybe you remember when we were at the 10-week intensive at the end, you gave us these big tea mugs. <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody got their, pers- their mug with a personalized message on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know very well that there was very to the point. <laughs> there was something on my mug with which talked about uh, I am here and I am the silence between the notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was kind of a blow in the face. Thank you. <laughs> but it was so true. And I hear myself, It, you know, it, of course, that always sticks with me. But um, it is fun, though, because I hear myself talking even this afternoon but probably a lot of times about active neutral and creating a place of silence because from creative from that place of silence even a soft aid or a soft sound or any or even a small um, feeling of energy can be heard and felt and um, so we were talking about that active neutral and how little sometimes you need. Um, but from that space of stillness, which takes still takes a little bit of self-discipline. I, I hate to admit, but it's true. <laughs> but um, from that place of stillness, everything becomes so much more beautiful. Yeah. I'm so happy you still remember that mug. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my yeah. goodness. That, that 10 weeks was, was awfully fun. <laughs> but yeah. That was, yeah, it was like one big shift. I think we I remember cool. saying so many times, no, Lisbeth, do nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh the, yeah it's it, like you said uh, we ambitious people <laughs> like to do yeah yeah things. exactly yeah. <laughs> cool yeah. well um so much good stuff in here um to start to wind it up do you have any um i mean you get you've already given lots of advice to people i hope people are rewinding this and writing notes because you gave so much good stuff for people to think about, but what are some pieces of, of advice that you could give <laughs> random people who you don't know who's listening, but <laughs> you've talked to enough students. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, well, probably one of the most important pieces of advice is guard your values. Uh, in this world where everybody um, tends to stick to methods and musts and rules and systems. Um, it's so easy to let yourself be guided beyond the limits of your values. Uh, I just want people um, in the name of their horses to guard their values. I think that's the most important part of all. Absolutely. Love that. And if if you get into a situation where somebody asks you or you feel pressured to do something that you think like, hmm, I don't know if I feel good about that afterward. And I think about my horse and how he lives that moment. Um, be ready to say no or to ask why. To ask for logic and explanations. I love that. Because I often hear, you know, sometimes when you ask why an instructor or, you know, they cannot really give you a good reason. If there's no good reason and it goes beyond your valid values, don't do it. Go on a research, find something else. Excellent advice. Yeah. Because I said so is the worst reason <laughs> to do many things <laughs> that people ask you to do. Yeah, exactly. That was wonderful. So much stuff in here, Lisbeth. We could talk for a long time, but we'll save it for us another podcast. Would you do another episode in the future? Sure. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Not like you're on the spot or anything. All right, Lisbeth, thank you so much for doing this. I know there's people getting lots and lots of stuff out of this. So until next time. Okay. Well, thank you for doing all this wonderful work. Yeah. And, um, um, maybe, you know, everybody, I have the, your link to your website and stuff in the show notes and people can find you on the dressage naturally website by going to events. And then there's a drop down. you'll see instructors, but maybe go ahead and just tell people where they can find you. And for people in the Netherlands, I know you have some, there's virtual and some live, um, support. So just let let people know how they can find you or or reach you. Yeah, people can find me on sporthorsemanshipunited.nl uh, or lisbethjorna.nl will also get you there. Um, and uh, yeah, for, you know, I I have people here. I teach people in clinics and trainings and, and private lessons and year programs at my home. Uh, but some, I also clinics uh, on location in the Netherlands and in uh, the in countries around the Netherlands. Now that COVID is gone, that's possible again. But I also have several people that I uh, teach uh, live, uh, but through the internet. And um, in, in several countries, really in different places in the world, very, very far away. And it works. So right now, with all the technology, we, we not only do video coaching, but we also do live long distance lessons. Um, so that's, that's for the people that are further away. And of course, we have your courses. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm always also guiding a few people through the Sweet Spot course. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, that's just fun stuff to do. Okay. So there's lots of stuff that we can do for you and uh, for awesome. you all. 
uh, whether you're in the Netherlands or you're further away, uh, plenty of possibilities. So you never have to get stuck. Don't ever get stuck. <laughs> Sounds good. Yep. And so I'll put the links in the show notes. You can find it through my website and your website is sporthorsemanshipunited.nl. And uh, so people can find you. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.